Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 546 of Locked On Canadians. It is Friday. That means it's the Friday mailbag. But before we get into all of our listener questions today, we're talking Rocky Wirtz. We're talking the first day of the women's uh, hockey at the Olympics and so much more. And that's all coming up inside today's show. Your Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone. And as we said, welcome to Locked On Canadians. We are your daily Montreal Canadiens podcast. I am one of your hosts. I am Scott Matla. I am done eating a three-tier sandwich that is sure to give me heartburn for the next six to eight months. And I am, (laughs) as always, joined by my fantastic co-host, the active stick, Laura Sava, who probably cannot wait to watch said video, which will be posted this weekend at some point, so everyone can take part in my um, monumental suffering uh, for the art. (laughs) I think, Scott, you also have to post the video that uh, you made when we hit 500 episodes, because I think that is a gem. I think it's a cinematic gem <laughs> that is not to be missed. I do think that that should be posted as well while you're while you're you know doing that over the weekend. Maybe do that for our listeners and our, our YouTube subscribers as well. And uh, yeah, it's it's exciting. And don't forget, folks, that if within a month's time, we hit 500 su- subscribers. I will also find something gross to consume um, and post a video of that as well. So if you want to see that, help us out and please send us, uh, well, subscribe and tell your friends about us so that they can subscribe as well um, because we want to get to 500 by, let's say, we said March 1st. So let's say uh, like midnight and Pacific time or Eastern time? We're in Eastern time. Eastern time. Yes. <laughs> uh, so midnight leading into March 2nd. So 11.59 Eastern time on March 1st. Uh, we want to get to 500 subscribers. And we want to say thank you to everybody who has already subscribed to our podcast on YouTube and also wherever you get your podcasts. Yes, seriously, it is. The support's been fantastic. And unfortunately, we're going to take a hard left turn here to start the show a little <laughs> bit because... Uh, the news last night was, well, I was watching the Laval Rocket play. Uh, I believe it's the owner of the Chicago Blackhawks. Rocky Wirtz uh, said some things which were not great. And the whole hockey world kind of reacted to this going, well, that seems really bad and, you know, ugly to see in text. And the context for it was bad in that I believe it was Mark Lazarus who uh, covers the Chicago Blackhawks asked what the team is doing to move forward and to build on what they learned from uh, the Kyle Beach lawsuit. And Rocky Wirtz told him, and I quote, that's none of your business. We're not talking about 2010 anymore. We're moving on and we're not talking about it, to which the entire hockey world with a conscience went, we know you're not talking about it. You did that for 12 years when you covered this all up. And he then followed up, I believe, another uh, reporter in Chicago. I can't remember if it's the Tribune, and uh, I could be wrong. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me right now. He asked what seemed like a reasonable question and also got yelled at by the owner of the team. And the text response of it was bad enough. And then someone posted the videos of it. And it was bad enough that Wayne Gretzky, who is not a man that has strong reactions to literally anything, questioned out loud, why would I want my child to play in this organization? Uh, We can't play the clip or else I would, but if you haven't watched it, take a chance to. It's horrifying not only to see someone in hockey act this way, but the owner of a team who was asked a perfectly reasonable question about how they're doing to, you know, help and build on what they've learned through this lawsuit and what they can do to prevent it from ever happening again. And the owner of a team yelled and screamed and threw a tantrum when one of the other people on stage who are very it was important- his son yes it was his son and it, it i believe as well that is the question that that is the person that the question was directed to was danny Wirtz. and uh well 
or I don't know if he, he was direct, if, if the question was directed to him, I can't remember. But Mark Lazarus asked the question and Danny started to answer it. Danny Wirtz started to answer it. And then Rocky Wirtz cut him off and yelled at him. And then he interjected. Danny tried to interject and sort of maybe mit mitigate the situation. Like they all, everybody on stage looked mortified. And um, and then Rocky Wirtz cut him off. And that in itself is, I believe, is the crux of the problem. And today, Rick West had reported that there are three more plaintiffs contemplating suing the Chicago Blackhawks over the same thing. Um, and uh, I believe they were players at uh, the University of Miami, which is where um, the... Um, the perpetrator of the sex sexual assault. I'm so sorry, I forget his name, but he was Brad Aldrich. Yes, uh, that's the was one. yeah. He he moved on to to Miami to coach at Miami uh, University, and uh, and so the, there are more plaintiffs, and so there was a little bit of of speculation as to whether he was so angry about that because he didn't want to talk about it because they knew that this lawsuit was coming and they were aware of it. But I think that the fundamental stance there is the problem. It's not necessarily just that, he, you know, he bit off people's heads. He cut off his son who was trying to give a constructive response. And to his credit, his son Danny later on uh, went and saw one of those reporters and said, I'm willing to talk to you on whatever you want to know about this and how, you know, what our plans are. But on stage, Rocky Wirtz was yelling, it's none of your business. You're not in the Chicago uh, organization. And in my head, I'm like, well... How else is this information going to get to the public? Because if I'm a player, I want to work for an organization that's going to protect me from this kind of stuff. If I'm a parent, I don't want my kid drafted by an organization that doesn't that covers the stuff up and doesn't take it seriously. You know, if I'm the public, I need to know what kind of a an organization I'm upholding as a fan, whether I'm buying their merch, whether I'm going to their games, whether I'm watching them uh, on 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 television whatever support that i'm providing and i think the problem is not just that he was angry about it i think the problem was that he wanted not to talk about it and he wanted he i think at the end of the day the way that it seemed like it it came across was that this was a nuisance to talk about and it was not being given serious weight and i think the only way to answer that question really is to say that you know there is a lawsuit. We're still working out those, so I can't comment too much, but I can promise that there are steps that are being taken and we will share them with you in due course. And that is literally, if you don't want to answer the question, that's pretty much the only way you can not answer the question and not come off the way he did, which is literally like the exact attitude that caused the problem in the, to begin with, which is the the on ice product or the or the hockey team itself is more important than somebody's well-being than somebody's safety than somebody um you know being able to come forward about a crime committed against them and 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 be taken seriously and not only that the correct steps to be taken and that in itself like everybody was appalled not just at his attitude but after everything that happened did he not learn like how callous and unempathetic can you be to not take that question seriously even at a base level and instead get angry that it was even asked like there is so much wrong with that attitude that stance so you know maybe maybe it's 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 not even just that he bit mark lazarus's head off it's people keep focusing on how rude he was which he was but at the end of the day, what caused that rudeness is the stance, is the attitude, is is what in my head, like I'm seeing this, I'm watching this as a person and I'm like, wow, like they probably don't even think that it was a big deal what happened. And that's the thing is this is what happens. It's a, it's amazing that they're still hiring a PR manager right now. Who wouldn't <laughs> want to work for this? And before we get into our next segment here, I'm going to read the first part of this exchange and this is just reading it. The video does it does this so much more justice. And this comes from Mark Lazarus. It starts with, my question is for Danny. I know we're looking forward here, but I think we have to look back also. I think much of what happened to Kyle Beach stemmed from the power imbalance between a coach and a player and the powerlessness of a player in that situation. So what are the Blackhawks doing and what have the Blackhawks done and what will the Blackhawks do to empower a player in a similar situation to make sure that doesn't happen again? That's a pretty softball question to just say we have programs in place or something. And Rocky Wirtz goes, I'm going to answer that question, not Danny. I think the report speaks for itself. The people that were involved are no longer here. 
false. The Wurtzes are still there. You're literally <laughs> having two players from the team that were there helping hire your new general manager. We're not looking back at 2010. We're looking forward, and we're not going to talk about 2010. That's abysmal. Rocky Wurtz should be ashamed. He should be out of as an owner, and there has to be some kind of answer from Gary Bettman here. And I, I'm going to leave it at that before I turn the same color as our wonderful overlay here on YouTube because it's in <laughs> watching the video. I had to. It's a minute and 16 seconds. I had to stop it four separate times. That's how bad it was. Uh, but coming up next, we're going to talk about the first day of women's hockey at the Olympics. Unfortunately, marred by some bad circumstances, but a lot of big names, a lot of big goals, and that's all coming up next. But first, everyone who knows this show knows that we love Built Bar. It's a new year. It means resolutions. It means going to the gym, eating better, and Built Bar is here for what you need. They have low calorie, low sugar, low fat, low carb, high in protein, everything you want from your protein bar every single day, and they are covered in 100% chocolate. Have them in the morning on the way to work. Have them as a midday pick-me-up. Have them when you leave the gym. There is something for everybody, and there is a flavor for everybody from things like you know caramel brownie, mint brownie, raspberry, orange, just plain double chocolate. There is something for everyone, and if you go to Built.com, they are always adding new flavors. Use our promo code LOCKED15. You're going to get 15% off your first order, so go check it out. Put together your variety box. Use our promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your next order. So the women's tournament in the Olympics got underway last night at 11 p.m. So Laura and I had finished recording, and it was just in time for the Team Canada game to start. And Team Canada's game started with a what felt like 37-year video review to check and <laughs> see if they had scored a goal. And one, props to them for being thorough, but also, if you can't figure it out in two minutes, it's a good goal. I think that should be the rule. I believe there were a couple of other people on Twitter who said the same things that if you can't figure it out in a small frame, it's a goal. We don't need to do a 10-minute review here. Uh, Canada rolled as expected over Switzerland, and the U.S. also rolled. But the big news for Team Canada is that uh, Melody Dawu suffered a pretty serious-looking injury in that game. Uh, unfortunately, I was asleep and I'm going off what I've seen. I am not going to watch a video of the injury because when we get to the Team USA no. here, not <laughs> going to do I'm not going to do it. I don't. No, 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 not, no don't. Do, I watched both. I heard both. No. Yeah, it's it. I, I don't think it's an empty arena because I believe there were people in the stands for the game. But when it's not as full as you would expect, you hear everything, which is great. You hear the communication on the ice. You hear people calling for the pucks and passing plays. You also hear players screaming in pain when they suffer severe injuries. And uh, it, it's not for the faint of heart. Let me put it that way. Um, but as of right now, Laura told me before the show that uh, Melody Dou's status has yet to be determined for the rest of the tournament. Uh, but as expected, I mean, Switzerland's not a bad team, but it's Canada. Canada is Canada and Canada does Canada things when they play women's hockey. Uh, it's impressive watching that. And it wasn't just the usual names. There were a lot of new names in there contributing. And Laura, I mean, we, you gotta be happy as a Canadian hockey fan with the way the tournament started for that. Absolutely. Obviously it's questionable right now. They're saying that Dao is resting and her status is as yet to be undetermined. I think it's possible that they just keep going with that stance, unless it's literally something that, they are for, that will for sure take her out. Like Decker's injury is for sure she's out, right, for the rest of the tournament. Um, and it's interesting because USA Hockey was giving Erica Ayala, who from Locked On Kraken, who is literally in Beijing covering this. And not only that, while you're here, um, check out Locked On NHL because they have very special women's hockey coverage uh, for the Olympics, um, hosted by Anne from the Locked On Predators show and Rachel from Locked On Flyers amazing amazing coverage and definitely definitely check them out but so Eric Ayala was saying the coach was not confirming Decker's status but she had heard from USA Hockey that you know she's out for the rest of the tournament and now it's been confirmed and there's still kind of a question mark as to what they're going to do about a replacement because there's some rules about flying people in and testing and all of that and um, the USA had originally chosen not to go with a taxi squad but as a, obviously as a Hockey Canada fan and as somebody who loves these women's tournaments I think um 
all of it for me is enjoyable because I always like seeing what new teams show up on the scene, uh, what teams take steps, you know, in the four years that we're seeing them. And if you're watching the world, the, the women's worlds and all of that, like you can see the, the progress in other markets as well in other in other countries and other nations. And I think that, you know, too often we have a conversation where it's like the U.S. and Canada and then everyone else. And I think it's it's like long overdue that we stop looking at it like that. We have to look at it as you know, how are these countries doing? Like what stars are emerging um, and, and, and all of that. And so, yes, it is, it's, it's generally, generally a, a foregone conclusion that the USA or Canada is going to beat you. Like that's, you know, and then, and, but I think it's, it's a huge disservice, not only to the sport, but to yourself as well. If you don't look, watch the tournament as a whole, if you don't appreciate the game and the players as a whole and only wait for those days that the USA and Canada play each other. I think, definitely for sure there are a lot of storylines in other countries and for me it really is like i love seeing the steps the strides that these other nations are taking forward and i hate when the conversation is like should you reduce the number of teams in this con no it's a huge honor for people to go to the olympics and this is how you're going to grow the game you're going to be like hey this country that's never been before they're going to watch these the, the women play hockey and be like I'm so interested in the sport maybe I'll sign up for it maybe I'll keep looking for women's hockey games in my area that I can watch or join it or anything like that and so for me I just I love the tournament for what it is but also for what it can be and I, I think, you know, I just want to caution against the narratives of like, oh, it's only two teams worth watching. And because I saw a lot of that yesterday and it was like, it's day one, you know, the, the opening ceremonies haven't even, even happened yet. Why are we talking about reducing the number of teams in this competition? What we should be talking about is look at how far some of these these countries that you wouldn't expect to be into hockey look how far they've come with how especially a lot of places like you know they have to fight for ice time against the men's teams uh, often very much they're underfunded depending on what nation they're they're from and all of that so i think you know for me i think it's just a, a matter of support to watch as many of the games as you can not just the u.s or canada games but also like i just i find that it helps grow it in other countries, but we can also help it along too. Like we're lucky, you know, you're from the U S I'm from Canada. Like these, these programs have come so far in so little time and they're way ahead of everybody else, but it doesn't mean that other people can't catch up. And it doesn't mean that we can't ca help them catch up. And, and that's the thing is too, is that the U S beat Finland five, two. And the thing is the U S was by far the better team. They had 50 shots to Finland's 10, but at the same time, Finland is a country that's growing as a hockey power. It has big hockey names in there, especially, especially in women's hockey. And it continues to grow is that we shouldn't dismiss that just because that's how the U S and Canada are. It's not a foregone conclusion. We've seen Finland upset the United States and I believe Canada. It happens. These things happen. And there are big name players playing for other teams. Alina Muller is one of the best players in women's hockey and she's playing for the Swiss team. And she's a delight to watch at Northeastern. And like you said, this tournament should be like, well, where's this person playing? Are they playing in the PHF? Cool. I'm going to go check out their games on ESPN. Oh, is this person playing in the PHWPA? Let me go, uh, or PWHPA, my apologies there. <laughs> uh, you know, let me go see if, they're, if their tour is coming anywhere near me that I can watch them. Oh, they're playing in the NCAA. Okay, can I watch this somewhere? And more often than not now, ESPN carries these things. It allows better access, and I think that's a huge step forward. And don't dismiss the term because the opening games are mismatched. Because if we did that, World Juniors wouldn't exist anymore when Canada and the U.S. beat up on, like, Slovenia, like, 12 nothing, and everyone gets completely bent out of shape about it. Uh, uh, as we did mention, too, uh, Brianna Decker is out for the tournament, at least as far as we know. It was... Uh, a very nasty injury. I watched it with the sound off. I regret watching it with the sound off and I will not watch it with the sound on. I advise you to not watch it with the sound on unless you don't want to sleep for the next three weeks. Um, <laughs> it's horrifying. It, it is a shame too, that two of the top players in this women's tournament are knocked out before the Olympic games have officially opened too. So it's not going to diminish the quality of the hockey played by either side, but it stinks that these players who train so hard to get to this spot and then have it kind of taken away from them at the last moment. Uh, now to pivot one more time from bad to good to fun. It is Friday. That means it's the Friday mailbag and we've got all of your listener questions coming up next. But first 
BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season approaches its climax at the Super Bowl. Right to the big game, folks. BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season, and it's not just football. BetOnline has up-to-minute info on pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, along with real-time live updates of current games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available for the 2022 season. Bet online where the game starts. So it is Friday when you're listening to this anyways. It is Thursday night when we are recording this. That means it is our Friday mailbag. If you ever want to send us questions at LO underscore Canadians on Twitter or locked on Canadians at gmail.com. Uh, Laura, let's dive right in. I know we got a few questions here, so let's just jump right into these. So the first one comes from a couple of days ago, and it's from Matt Whirlpool. And the question is, how have you all thought Primo has developed in the last two years? Under the impression that he was a leading prospect, but feel like he never makes it to the third period. Defensive support aside, how has he fared? Uh, So I think you kind of have to split up his performance to AHL and NHL, don't you? At the AHL, he's been great. Uh, At the NHL level, he's kind of getting hung out to dry, but his results haven't been what they need to be. And I don't know if it's a confidence thing, if it's just a team thing or what, but he has brief moments and then he can't find the consistency right now. And I don't know how much of that has to do with just the team in front of him isn't playing very well. It's got to be kind of soul crushing, honestly. So uh, I still think he's a very good goaltender. I think he can develop into something very good. He just needs a consistent system or consistency in his game right now. And I don't think he's really finding that because... Who on the Canadians is finding consistency this year outside of being uh, consistently bad on the ice? So <laughs> so I do think I, I kind of agree with you. I'm going to be quick because I, I just realized we have one segment for all the questions. But um, I do think that a part of it is, um, you know, the team kind of has to look at it and be like, all right, unlike in Montreal, everywhere else, generally your NHL team is better than your AHL team. Um, and so when you're talking about Primo facing AHL competition and he's he's had really good results, I think that it, it necessitates the next step in development. So the team and him and his coaches and all of that, they kind of have to get together and try and figure out what the best way for him to do, what the best way for him to prepare for the next step is. And part of it obviously is seeing more competition in the NHL, which, you know, He hasn't played that many games. His results aren't that great, but he also has not played that many games. And, you know, you're lucky in that this isn't like a a season where the Stanley Cup is on the line for the Canadians. So they can afford to play him more if they want to. Um, But I think just, you know, he just has to see a lot of volume and kind of get used to it. And that will also enable the team to kind of figure out what his weakness is and uh, and, uh, how to, you know, help him sort of develop. Uh, Our friend JD from Locked on Ducks asks us thoughts on the skills competition craziness in Las Vegas. I'm really looking forward to the blackjack (laughs) shooting contest because it's very Vegas and it seems very fun to kind of put a spin on accuracy shooting. Uh, I still think that I want to see the all-star game become, Hey, there's the guys playing in the all-star game. And then we brought a bunch of guys for the skills competitions. Like Paul Byron is one of the fastest skaters in the NHL. I want to see him do fastest skater. Because why not? I know McDavid is fast. Cool. That's not news. I know Matt Barzal is fast. That's not news. Let me see, you know, this guy go out there. Like, what about like some bottom pairing defenseman who only really plays on the power play because he can shoot? Like, I want to see that. But the skills contest is always the most fun. And despite everyone going, this is terrible or hate it, everyone's watching it anyways. So uh, I can't wait to see the blackjack shooting. Honestly, that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. I just think it's really cool that they tried to put a Vegas skin on a spin on the skills competition. Um, and I would like to see every market do that. You know, like we've seen a lot of the same in many, many years, but, and, and Vegas is you're lucky with Vegas because there are so many things that are very unique to Vegas, but I feel like it's an opportunity to get creative. You know, when you're pitching to the NHL that you want the all-star game in your city, try and try and come up with competitions like that, like, like skills comp or whatever, even modifications to the all-star game itself. You know, you want to do a best on best. You want you want to get the NHL to give you that, that, that boost. Um, 
come up with creative ways to do it. And then you get the fans watching. You get, you know, people always talk about how the All-Star game is for new fans, is try to attract new fans. But I'm excited about tomorrow's competition. And I've been a hockey fan for like, I don't know, 20 years maybe. So it's a, it's a lot. Anyway, speaking of, we've got a question from Stefan. And the question is, for Friday Mailbag, what made the two of you fans of the Canadians? Saku Koivu. Uh, yeah. <laughs> his, his return from cancer was one of those really inspiring things and got me to kind of start following the team. I kind of fell out of it for a little bit and came back uh, to fall in love with the team just in time for the 2010 playoff run. And then it was just kind of locked in, like, for sure from there on out. Saku's my reason too. That game that he came back was actually the first game hockey game I'd ever watched in my life or NHL game that I'd watched in my life. And, um, and you know, to this day, that's why I hate the senators <laughs> to this day. That's why I love the Habs to this day. That's why I have so many feelings about sports in general and, and, and the sport. And that's why, you know, when we're talking about the first uh, segment, we were talking about um, how the organization, the Chicago Blackhawks organization has done something so horrible. Like I feel like, I want to live those moments where it's beautiful and it's like, you know, romanticized and it's a triumph and all of that. And the only way to do that is to remove all the elements of the sport that are, that are ruining it essentially and ruining people's lives as well. Anyway, that's my soapbox, but it's Saku forever. Um, Saku forever. And then we've got, <laughs> we've got our friend goalie droid who wants to know our thoughts on Nick Suzuki's new suit. Now, I can't show this to you because I don't know if we're allowed to because we were told we can't use clips, we can't use audio, we can't use anything. Uh, but the person who designed uh, Nick Suzuki's new suit is, you can find them on Instagram at jfbedard.custom. And I went and I looked at this because Goalie Droid was kind enough to provide a link. Um, and this is a beautiful suit. It's got a custom lining on the inside and I believe... Uh, the custom lining is a Bengal tiger because he's got Nick Suzuki has got a snow Bengal. Like anyway, it's a really, really cool looking suit. I hope he's wearing it to the all-star game and we all get to see it this weekend. If not, you can find jfbedard.custom on Instagram and it'll say, uh, you'll see that beautiful suit. So that's goalie droid always has awesome questions for us. And then before we get to our nemesis question of the week, we've got our friend Blaine Potman, obviously. Uh, who is such a, like, he's always interacting with us and we're big fans. Uh, and the question is, will the mascot competition come down to a grudge match between Yuppie and his illegitimate son, Gritty? I mean, I hope so. And I hope they have like that father it bonding moment because I don't <laughs> quite know what to describe Gritty as in that they just take the league by storm from there. So like, I, I think that's what, if the NHL was smart, that's what they would do. Is that what they're going to do? Probably not, but that's definitely what should happen just for the hilarity alone. Yeah, and I think Gritty is like, it's it's a huge thing for the NHL because a lot of people that don't even know anything about the NHL know about Gritty and love Gritty. I think there's an opportunity to start kind of beef or storylines between mascots and sort of get people into it. I know um, our boss at the, at the network, Sean Woodley loves mascots. We're not talking about King cake, baby. I'm not, I've had enough nightmare fuel today <laughs> between the sandwich oh and God. the hockey injuries. We're not, we're not making our viewers look at King cake, baby. I can't okay. do that to them. <laughs> We don't have time to Google right now, but I want to know if there's like a mascot convention where like all the mascots of all the major league sports meet or like, I don't know, do they go and like travel around the world? And like, so you know, I, I can answer that. When I went to the AHL really? all-star game, uh, the mascots partied together uh, and they go hard. Are you serious? They go hard because I was talking to one of them the next morning afterwards, the person who was that and he's like, there were people that slept at the arena from the after party. Like they went. Hard. Wow. <laughs> so I love that. It's really, really fun to know. All right. So our nemesis, Will Christ asks us if hypothetically, hypothetically, you were going to attempt to steal something, for example, a rectangle of tin from a public playground, what would your strategy be? And I need to contextualize this by saying that there is some sort of, $11.7 million block of gold in Central Park somewhere for one day. So I sent it to him very much with the intention of how would you plan this heist instead he turned the question on us. So how, what would your strategy be? So I, I'm going to go ahead and say no violence allowed. That's my rule. It's not Will's rule, but I, I don't want there to be violence. What, do you, what would you do? 
Step one, hire one of Ryan Reynolds or The Rock, offering to cut them in on the profits of stealing this. Have them distract everybody, helicopter with a magnet. Ooh. How do I afford all this? I don't care. I have a giant brick of gold. You have you have a you have a bank like somebody bankrolling this because they're gonna get a cut, right? Yeah, exactly. So, like I gotta pay off Dwayne, close personal friend of the show, uh, the helicopter pilot, <laughs> and whoever my shadow broker is to do all this. But assuming I, I don't have the price of gold in front of me, but assuming that it's worth enough, I can pay off all of them and still make out pretty well on my own. So I think I'm gonna go with the hey, look over there at the muscular handsome man, and then steal it with a helicopter. So I, I, I've been watching White Collar. I just went through the whole thing. And there's one episode where they go to like buy helicopters. There's no, I don't need to explain why. But like, I think in the in the show, the price tag of the helicopter is $800,000. So if that's what it costs to buy one, it must be significantly cheaper to borrow one for like an afternoon. I was gonna say, I mean, like, there's got to be like an old person that it's like, hey, you have a winch on your helicopter. Let's go do this thing. Here's enough money that you can move out of wherever you're at. And it's 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 genius. It's genius. Will's gonna think it's stupid because he's probably got this all planned out and he has for a while now. But uh, that that's just how Will is as a person, honestly. Yeah, he's probably been planning this heist forever, and it just you know it just happens to be if if the thing disappears, we know where to. I was gonna say I'm gonna start look. knocking on Will's DMs, and be like, so buddy, you know, uh, is that it for <laughs> questions, Laura? Thing is gone. <laughs> yes, it is. All right. As always, folks, if you want to send us mailbag questions at LO underscore Canadians or locked on Canadians at gmail.com, you can follow Laura at the active stick. You can follow me at Scott Matla on Twitter. You can find us wherever you find your podcast. You can find us on YouTube. Please keep subscribing. So Laura has to eat gross things instead of me for once. Uh, thank you so much for making us your first listen of the day. Every single day, make your second listen, locked on bets, check them out in case you wanted to bet on Super Bowl, hockey, anything else. Your boy Q and Lee Sterling have absolutely been killing it. We will see you all on Monday.